Hello and welcome to Paiju's Exam Prep IAS. Let's begin today's session of the Hindu analysis with the first article that talks about the rights of the tribal population in the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. The article focuses on the interim report that is shared by the Delimitation Commission appointed specifically for the new Legislative Assembly of the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. The Jammu and Kashmir Delimitation Commission in its interim report points out that there should be an increase of six seats in the Jammu province, while one seat should be increased in the Kashmir area. Not just this, it also proposes that there should be nine seats reserved for the scheduled tribes. Now, this is the point of contention in the entire article. This is for the first time that there will be certain seats reserved for the scheduled tribe population in Jammu and Kashmir. Before that, we used to have scheduled caste reservation. Even the Delimitation Commission also says that seven seats should be reserved for scheduled caste. But the reservation for scheduled tribes was never given in the Jammu and Kashmir Legislative Assembly. Although the state has lump sum 14 lakh scheduled tribe population. The article says that for a very long time, the tribal population in the state of Jammu and Kashmir had been denied their rights. And it is just about time that they are given these constitutional rights through reservation in the state legislative assembly. The commission has not suggested any increase in the number of reserved seats for scheduled caste. Even earlier, when Jammu and Kashmir used to be a state, seven seats were reserved for scheduled caste. So there is no change in the scheduled caste equation. The only change is with respect to scheduled tribes where nine seats would now be reserved. As I said, the reservation for scheduled tribes is actually a constitutional guarantee under Article 332. However, till 1991, no tribal community in the state of Jammu and Kashmir was given the scheduled tribe status and that is why we did not really have any discussion about the scheduled tribe reservation. However, after 1991, there were four communities in the state of Jammu and Kashmir that is the Gujars, the Bakarwals, the Gaddis and the Sippis which were given the status of scheduled tribe. And thus, even after they got the status not to have any reservation, the legislative assembly was always a point of debate. Whenever asked about this, the political parties used to say that because of the presence of Article 370, this reservation cannot be given. But the article says that the reality is that Article 370 never prevented reservation to be given to scheduled tribes. Rather, it was a question of the political will of the parties in Jammu and Kashmir. In fact, not just a scheduled tribe reservation. Over the years, even before the dilution of Article 370, many features of the Indian constitution, many laws passed by the Indian parliament were extended to Jammu and Kashmir gradually. And thus, even the scheduled tribe reservation could have been extended if and only if the political parties wanted it. So to hide behind Article 370 is illogical here. Even in 2007, when Gulab Nabi Azad used to be the Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir, the government did try to introduce a resolution to introduce the ST reservation in the Legislative Assembly. However, that did not materialize. The author here says that the biggest reason why we never had tribal population of the state given their rights was because the two major political groups in the valley, that is the Dogras and Kashmiris, never wanted their power to be shared with anyone. While the Dogras mainly reside in the Jammu area, Kashmiris live in the Kashmir Valley. Now, although we did have SC reservation, it did not bother any of the two. The reason being that the people who occupied these scheduled caste seats were actually Dogras only. So the Dogra community was not worried about their power going away. On the other hand, since these scheduled caste seats that were reserved were only from the Jammu area and not from the Kashmir area, the Kashmiri political leaders did not really mind having an SC reservation. So it suited both of them. However, when it came to the tribal population, none of these two political groups wanted to share their power. And that is why even the 2006 Forest Rights Act was not implemented in the state for the longest time. It was only after dilution of Article 370 in August 2019 that these two important provisions, that is, reservation for scheduled tribes in the legislature, and the provisions of Forest Rights Act of 2006 were promised to the tribal population in the area. Now, if you look at the State Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir, you would notice that many of the MLAs at that time were from the Gujar community. So you might argue, why do they even need reservation when they are anyways winning these seats? The article says that in 2014, the Gujar community, even without the benefit of the reservation, 
managed to win some assembly seats. But the problem is, since these seats are very scattered and these MLAs belong to different political parties, they were never able to come together and raise the real tribal issues. Because at the end of the day, the entire purpose of reserving some seats for scheduled tribes is that we would have a healthy representation of the tribal community in the legislature and then they would take up the issues of the tribal community which are really not discussed at the important level. So even when we did have MLAs from the Gujar community, since they were from different political parties, since their priority was not about raising tribal issues, that is why we still need to have ST reservation so that apart from the Gujar community who can win their own elections, we should have more tribal people in the assembly so that the tribal issues take the center stage. The author also points out that as per the interim report, the nine seats that should be reserved for scheduled tribes, out of those, six would belong to two districts of Rajori and Poonch. These two districts together have about 32% of the state's tribal population, meaning that the other parts of the state, which have 68% of the tribal population of the state, would have only three scheduled tribe seats. So the distribution of the scheduled tribe reserved seats also has to be looked into. We cannot have minimal ST reservation from those areas where there is a considerable population of the scheduled tribes. And finally, we should rejoice the fact that the tribal population, which is about 14 lakhs in Jammu and Kashmir, are finally getting their rights. Now, let's also look into what exactly are the important provisions of the Forest Rights Act of 2006 that this article talks about. This particular act was passed to recognize the rights of forest dwelling tribal community. Dwelling means residing. So this law was specifically to look into the rights that those tribal population have that live in the forest itself. So there are some tribal communities that live in the forest and non-tribal communities also that are forest dwellers. Both of these would be getting some rights. For example, the communities which are living in the forest for a long time for many generations, many of them are taking care of a part of the forest area. They are growing their food in that area. They have built their house in that area. But officially, they don't have any document to prove that that part of the land is their own. So under this particular law, the people who have been living in the forest for a long time, the government will give them official documentation to prove that, yes, this is your area. This plantation is yours and you can take advantage of the minor forest produce in this area so that no one tomorrow will come and displace you. This was the essential provision of the Forest Rights Act. It recognizes the forest rights and occupation in the forest of the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other people who are forest dwellers who are not a part of the scheduled tribes as well. In order to determine who shall get the rights of that land, Gram Sabha was given the authority to initiate this process and determine how much forest rights does a community have in that area. Now the law says that the right to ownership to land will be given to tribals or forest dwellers to a maximum of four hectares. Only that land will be given to them which they have been cultivating for a long time and no new piece of land will be granted. Also, they will have the right to extract minor forest produce, they can use that area for grazing etc. In case they have been forcefully evicted from the land or they have been displaced from that area, the government will also help them. The law also gives a right to the people living in the forest to protect, regenerate and manage the community's forest resources for sustainable use. The good part about this law is, it will ensure that the 5th and the 6th schedule of the Indian constitution becomes strengthened, that the rights of the tribal population are given to them completely. It will also address the problem of alienation of tribals. As you know, one of the reasons that the Naxal movement became so strong in India was because a tribal community had this problem that they were not given the rights of their land by the government. That is what attracted them towards the side of the Naxal leaders who promised them that we will give you your land forcefully. So it will bring the tribals closer to the government, closer to the authorities and far away from joining the Naxal movement. It will also democratize the forest governance because a Gram Sabha has been given the power to initiate the process. So it is an example of how grassroots democracy can flourish even further. Now that this act has become operational in Jammu and Kashmir also, you can expect that the tribal population in that union territory will get their own rights as well. 
The next article that we have here talks about the decision of the Karnataka High Court to strike down the state government's effort to ban online gaming. Now, in very simple terms, the issue is that in the past few years, a lot of online games have emerged of different types. Those are fantasy leagues. For example, when there's a cricket match going on, you can form your own team and see who scores most of the points. For example, Dream 11, etc. Then there are online rummy games, online poker, etc. The state governments argue that this is gambling and thus it should be banned. The question here is whether or not these games are a game of skill or a game of chance. The broad provision of law in India is that if it is a game of skills, then it will be allowed. But if it is a game of chance, then it is gambling and then it will not be allowed. Simple. Many people have argued in the Supreme Court that these games are a game of skills. And if they can prove that, the court allows that to continue. This is what has happened in the Karnataka High Court as well. The Karnataka government recently tried to introduce some new regulations on betting and gambling, but the Karnataka High Court struck it down. The same happened last year with the Madras High Court striking down the state government's effort to introduce similar regulations for online rummy and online poker. As I pointed out, the courts have said that these laws have failed to make a distinction between a game of skills and a game of chance. As per the court, the government thinks that all the online games are a game of chance, but that is not the case. There has to be a clear distinction between what are the games of skills which should be allowed and what are the games of chance that can be banned. We cannot ban every single online game, keeping our eyes closed. The court said that we accept the fact that online gaming and addiction of online gaming can be bad, but the solution is not for the government to ban all the online games. The Karnataka government had argued that online gaming in the past few years has ruined many families because of this gaming addiction. Many people are borrowing money just to play these online games and that has taken up a form of gambling. But the court did not agree. The court said that yes, there is an addictive element to online gaming, but that does not mean that you can take away individual freedom or choice. At the end of the day, it is a choice of the individual if he or she wants to play those games online. Now, as I said, this question of online gaming, whether is it a game of chance or a game of skills, has been asked in the court multiple times in the past few years. Let us go through the history of how online gaming has become such a big phenomenon in India. It is mainly during the pandemic and the lockdowns that the average time spent by an Indian on online gaming has increased considerably. In fact, right now, the online gaming industry in India is over 275 gaming companies and around 30 crore gamers of various levels. In fact, a 2019 survey found out that India had the second largest number of gamers after South Korea. Presently, there are different regulations in different states with respect to online gaming. The reason of having different regulations is that gambling is a part of the state list. Since it is a state list subject, different states have made their own legislations. For example, Goa, Sikkim and the Union Territory of Daman have not prohibited gambling. So if you go to Gangtok or if you go to Goa, you can find a lot of holdings of casinos where you can go and play legally. But most other states have banned any form of gambling or betting. But the debate has become even stronger with a lot of these new online portals coming in introducing online rummy, online poker, fantasy games, etc. Thus, various high courts have legitimized gaming formats such as fantasy sports and online games which require certain skill. There are some important cases which you can remember. In a case called Varun Gumbar vs. Chandigarh, Gurdeep Singh Sachar vs. the Union of India and Avinash Mehrutra vs. Rajasthan, the courts have found out that fantasy games are a predominant format of game of skills and not a game of chance. In fact, in the Jungli Games case, the Madras High Court ruled that the games like poker, rummy are also games of skills. Jungli Games is the name of the company that allows people to play online poker and online rummy. That does not mean that the online gaming has no bad impact. In fact, in 2018, long before the pandemic, the WHO categorized gaming disorder as a mental health condition. There have been many incidents that you would have read in the papers where people are selling their stuff at the homes 
just to get money and play games online. When it reaches that extreme, that is where it becomes a concern for the state, which forces the states to bring in regulations with respect to online gaming. The next article that we have talks about the significance of caste data. As you know, the caste-based census has been a matter of debate for many years now. The simple question is, when the census data will be collected, as it had to be done in 2021, should we have a specific caste-based data or not? Many political parties want caste-based data to be a part of the census, while some other political parties don't want it. There are arguments given on both the sides. This particular article is giving pointers in favor of having caste-based data and says that it will allow us to make much more accurate and directed policies which will be for the betterment of the entire country. The article says that the Supreme Court recently upheld 27% OBC reservation in the All India Quota for the NEET examination, something that we have discussed multiple times earlier as well. The court said that when you talk about reservations in India, you can't just expect that giving equal opportunity to write the examination is the end of the question. The court has said that not just access to good education, but we have to understand that those who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, maybe because of their caste, maybe because of their financial background, these people have faced financial and social hardships for many years in their life when they would have been preparing for this examination. So the impact of social discrimination, the psychological impact, all of that cannot be taken out of the question while we are deciding whether or not the government should make special provisions for these classes of citizens. There are many people in India who still oppose the concept of affirmative action. Now, for those who don't know this, affirmative action means the government has a responsibility to make favorable laws or policies specifically for those sections of citizens which have been discriminated against in the past. Those can be women, those can be people belonging to specific caste, those can be minorities, etc. Different countries have different ways of undertaking affirmative action. The simplest way for the government to take affirmative action is to reserve certain seats in important institutions. So in India also, we have affirmative action under which seats are reserved for scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, other backward classes, and even the economically weaker section. However, some people in India oppose the idea of reservation since they believe that such provisions actually give encouragement to caste differences. These are the people who want a caste-less society. But the Supreme Court recently, in the need judgment, said that caste-lessness in itself is a privilege and only those people who are from the upper caste can afford it. For example, only when you have a lot of money can you afford to say that no money does not matter. If you are a poor person, then for you, the money does matter a lot. Only when you have become successful in life, only then you can argue that, no, I don't want to have anything else in my life. I don't want to have any more money. But if you don't have food, but if you don't have your basic requirements fulfilled, for you, the priorities will be very different. So the judge also said, castlessness is a privilege that only the upper caste can afford. On the contrary, if someone belongs to the lower caste, they have to retain their caste identity if they have to take benefits of reservation. So government, in fact, rather than making provisions so that we move past the caste identity, is actually forcing people to cling on to their caste identity. Because only when they tell the world what is their caste identity, only and only then they will get the benefit of the reservation. So the government also has to look into how is it helping or not helping us move past this caste question. The author says that it is a very common practice before every elections that political parties make promise of giving reservation to specific communities. For example, when the Gujarat elections were happening, the political parties said that the Partidar community or the Patils will get reservation under the OBCs. When Haryana elections were happening, the same was promised to the Jat community. So political parties very often make these promises. However, the interesting part is these promises are made without even collecting any credible data. For example, if you are promising reservation to the Partidar community or to the Jat community or to any other community, have you even collected the data? Are they really backward? Do they really have a social issue that they need help with and you are giving them help with reservation? But the political parties don't have any such data. 
when they make these promises they only make these promises from the point of view of whether or not it will give them enough votes to win the election or not that is why most of such promises even when they are implemented have been struck down take an example of the supreme court striking down the maratha community reservation in maharashtra when the supreme court said that it is in access to 50% limit set in the indra sahani case thus as per the author if such reservations have to be given in the future for specific communities or even if the political parties want to make any such promises the first step has to be a caste based census without knowing how many people do we have from a specific caste without knowing their average income without knowing the social problems that they are facing how can we even think about giving any reservation on the basis of caste that is why there is a specific need to have a caste based data prepared for the entire country now the interesting part is that in 2011 we did have a socio economic caste census but the most interesting part is that the central government itself that conducted the census said that the data that we collected is faulty and unreliable so if the government itself does not trust the last caste based census that it did why are we not going ahead and doing this kind of a census again as you can see this article in the newspaper of 2021 in which the center government itself told the supreme court that the 2011 caste census data is unusable and we can't add it to the 2021 data so the government not only does not want to include this caste based data in the new 2021 census they don't even want the old data to be revealed and saying that it is faulty and we cannot use it now this move by the government to not have a caste based data as per the author goes against the statutory provisions for instance the national commission for backward classes act 1993 under section 11 said that the central government may every 10 years revise the list of the backward classes to exclude those who have ceased to be backward and include new backward classes but again this has not been done because if you think from the government's point of view for the government to exclude any class of citizens saying that now you will not get reservation benefits can be detrimental to their political ambitions it is very easy to give reservation and other benefits to the citizens but it is almost impossible to take it back because you know that it will hurt you immensely and that is one of the reasons why the central government irrespective of whichever party is in power has never taken up this exercise of revising the obc list and thus it is high time that we have credible data in this regard if we really want to make policies that impact the people in real life now you have heard a lot of arguments about the caste based census in india the need for it and the problems associated with it let's see what exactly is the need for having a caste based census the first and the most obvious advantage is it would help the government in making much better targeted policies when they know that a specific caste of people are facing a specific set of issues or their average income is lower just because they belong to a specific caste it will allow the government to make many more targeted policies to help that particular caste it will also reveal whether some people after getting reservation benefits don't need it anymore it will reveal whether some classes of citizens are actually now privileged so that reservation benefits can be taken away from them and given to those who deserve it more it will also help us address prevalent inequalities for instance you can't just say that 100 caste in india belong to the other backward caste amongst those 100 also some caste might have some more problems as compared to others so amongst the obcs also which caste specifically requires more help from the government so that better provisions can be made for them this can only be found out when we have specific data that tells us those details it is also a constitutional mandate article 340 mandates the appointment of the commission to investigate the condition of socially and educationally backward classes and make recommendations for their improvement one other interesting part is that it will help us bust many myths there are a lot of myths going around that this particular caste earns a lot of money this particular caste has a lot of people but only when we have specific data can we know the reality for example for a long time there have been claims that if you look at the state of karnataka the lingayats are the most populous caste but a lot of studies have shown that this might not be true so reservation benefits given to specific caste should be 
based on clear scientific data rather than political ambitions of the parties in power there are some challenges as well for example there can be repercussions of a caste census it might go against the secular harmony of the country it might set one caste against the other which is not good for the country and the other problem is that many people might not want to reveal their caste when such a census is being converted a lot of people do not want to associate themselves with a particular caste if they think that that will be detrimental to their social image so forcing those people to share that information might not go well with a lot of people however a lot of committees in the past have suggested taking up such exercise i'll give you two examples such a committee report suggested creation of a national data bank that will tell us about a lot of parameters about every citizen of india including the caste the justice rohini report also in 2017 said that the government should look into sub categorization of the obc community meaning that as i said among the obcs which community wants more support or needs more support of the government because their social or economic status might be weaker as compared to others however that can only be done if we have a credible caste based data in the form of a census conducted by the government the next article from today's newspaper focuses on the swamitva scheme the objectives of the scheme have they been met or not and why exactly is the government planning to introduce this scheme now in very simple terms the swamitva scheme is an effort of the government to undertake land surveys of all the villages across the country prepare digital maps and also the 3d maps of the entire country for over 100 cities this scheme is being piloted by the ministry of panchayati raj now you must understand that in the rural areas one of the most important issues for which people even go to the judiciary is the dispute of the land a lot of people living in the villages have small or big pieces of land on which they take up certain agriculture now in most cases those pieces of land are based on old handmade maps of many years back the problem is that there are very frequent disputes about where exactly does the boundary of one's land ends and where exactly does the other person's land begins that is why a lot of these cases time and time again go to the gram sabha they are also taken up in the lok adalat and they even reach the higher judiciary to ensure that that does not happen again the government is trying to digitize all these maps with the help of surveys undertaken by high tech drones this scheme has been running since 2020 the first phase of this scheme was an experimental phase where only a few states were included but now it has been transformed into a pan india scheme we discussed in yesterday's cna also that the government in 2021 had released relaxed guidelines for the geospatial sector in india allowing the private companies to also come into this and prepare 3d maps of as many places in india as possible the government points out that those relaxed guidelines will allow this swamitva scheme to work much more efficiently with the participation of the private sector also the union minister recently said that the guidelines released by the government now will help the private companies in preparing a variety of maps without needing approval of a number of ministries and departments the exact same thing that we discussed yesterday it will be much easier to use drones and develop applications with the help of location mapping it will help the government in ensuring that there is mapping for forest management disaster management will become much more efficient the government will also have digitized version of the land records so the cases in the judiciary will also lighten up the government will also have exact information about water distribution and the government can also make sure that the property taxation methods also become much more efficient the drone surveys have already covered over 1 lakh villages and maps of over 77000 have already been handed over to the states after these surveys the government is also handing over property cards to the villagers to ensure that they have a legal right to exact property where they are living so that any legal disputes there on can be resolved very easily now the swamitva scheme as i said stands for survey of villages abadi and mapping with improvised technology in the village areas this is mainly aiming to provide the record of rights to the village population as i said the issues of land and where exactly does one's land ends and begins is a very old problem in rural india that is because the maps are not digitized and there are no proper land records available with the people 
issuance of property cards under this particular scheme aims to help resolve that problem the property owners in these areas can download the aadhaar authenticated property card on their mobile phones and keep it stored in the digi locker app not just this it will also ensure that there is an accurate land record for rural planning taken up by the government from now on it will also help the government of india in introducing better solutions for rural india serve as a solution for all the property related disputes facilitate the determination of property tax create a survey infrastructure for the geographic information system maps and much more as i said earlier the pilot phase of the scheme that was rolled out in six states was in april 2020 and after its successful implementation now it has become an all india scheme and was finally rolled out in its final shape in april 2021 this is a prime example of how with the use of technology the government of india can make the lives of the people better it can also be a great example to be used in your governance exams especially to cite an example of e governance the next article that we have talks about the opportunity that indian entrepreneurs and the tech industry has especially in the wake of the government of india banning another set of chinese apps over national security and privacy concerns as you know the government recently gave an order of banning over 50 chinese apps saying that these compromise india's national security now although china does not like it and says that it is discriminatory and the trade practices will be challenged in wto The fact remains that China in fact has been following this strategy for many decades extremely successfully. In fact, some of the most famous apps that we use here in India including Google, YouTube, Instagram don't even exist in China. What China has done is they have banned these apps much earlier and it has allowed the Chinese local entrepreneurs to develop a parallel solution and a parallel app that does exactly the same thing. and thus it has given a push to the local entrepreneurship the article here says that banning of the chinese apps such as tiktok pubg and others gives the same opportunity to india and the indian entrepreneurs the story goes back to jan 2010 when google had announced that there have been hacking attacks on the company servers in china and that is why they will no longer censor the searches in china and would completely pull out of the country Since 2010 the Chinese internet market has grown three folds and now it has over 90 crore users from 30 crore in 2010 to fill in the gap that was left by Google and other nations the Chinese entrepreneurs developed their own apps for example in the absence of Amazon they have Alibaba in the absence of WhatsApp they have the WeChat in the absence of Google they have Baidu and in the absence of YouTube they have Youku Tubo Many of these apps even find a large audience outside China. Take an example of WeChat. It was a simple messaging app in the beginning just like WhatsApp and now it also provides social media, news, payments, digital commerce and much more. The same can be replicated in India as well by our entrepreneurs. This has allowed the Chinese tech industry to experiment and has allowed the Chinese entrepreneurs to become leaders in many interesting and cutting edge technologies. For example, the 2016 White House report said that China has leapfrogged even the US in field of artificial intelligence, neural network and deep learning. At the same time, while the Indian industry has been doing very well for itself, our IT industry has mainly been focused on outsourcing rather than building a product that is truly India made and that has captured the Indian growing internet audience there are hardly any apps that are made in India which have actually captured the imagination of the entire country few exemptions can be flipkart but now that also is owned by the walmart group this opportunity is very big especially considering that after the entry of jio and many other competitors there has been an extremely wide reach of internet connections across the country The number of internet users in India have grown many fold in the past few years and thus these companies have a ready made audience that they can target. Thus it is the best time for the home grown IT talent in India to utilize this internet base that we have ready in India. There have been some apps that have come up after the banning of the Chinese apps. For example, there are a lot of alternatives to TikTok now. There are some alternatives to games such as PUBG, but the article says that we need to go beyond our thinking of just copying what chinese apps used to do and we need to make our own products that will attract people much more for instance india is a very very diverse country 
not all the people in india speak the english or the hindi language there are many other local languages whose solutions still remain unresolved for example if we can have a banking app or a news based app especially having an odia interface or having a gujarati or punjabi interface it can still tap into a market that is still unexplored there is also opportunity in bringing hyper local solutions there are still a lot of merchants in the market that are away from the online world bringing them online making apps based on them and focus on their business can also help the country be a part of this it revolution around the world the other part of the story which i wanted to highlight here is the reason why we are banning chinese apps is the concern over data theft and national security there have long been allegations that these apps which are being used by users in india of chinese origin they save the data of indian citizens and then they shared with the chinese government which is detrimental to our interest now you also would have seen that the government of india has been trying to convince many tech companies including facebook and twitter to have their servers based in india so that the information of their users is saved in india only but that also has not happened just to give you an idea of how the data storage works so if you are buying something from let's say an e-commerce portal then you mostly pay by your credit card your credit card company be it visa or mastercard they verify from your bank do you have the required limit or do you have the required money or not after verification the transaction is completed the money from your bank is transferred to the e-commerce website and in between visa or mastercard whichever that company is that has issued the card they make sure that the transaction happens perfectly now that means that your data whatever you have entered is stored in the servers of visa or mastercard those servers mainly are based in the us right now on the other hand if you use rupee card or indian made wallets then your data is stored in india that means it is covered under the law that is made by the indian government the problem with your data being stored overseas is that it will not be under the jurisdiction of the indian government and the laws made by the parliament similarly when you go abroad and you shop let's say at a supermarket again whenever you swipe a card your data gets stored in the servers that are kept in the us that is a threat that we have with china and the us that when you use their apps when you pay for something or even when you enter data that data gets stored in the servers that are kept in their countries which makes us and our citizens susceptible to chinese interference in many fields and that is why we are banning these apps which we think are storing this kind of a data these were the articles we wanted to share from the hindu newspaper now a couple of practice questions number 1 A decline in the Chinese growth story presents an opportunity for India to stake a claim as the world's factory. Discuss the challenges in achieving this mission. Second, discuss the major objectives of the Swamitva scheme. How would it help in resolving ground level disputes? Both these questions have to be answered within two fifty words each. Thank you so much for watching the video.